Tonight's event, uh, of course, is prescient, being on the anniversary of the Egyptian Revolution. And uh, Alwan, as well as a few organizations, thought that it was appropriate to, 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 uh, to analyze, to discuss what had happened, what can happen, what we predict will happen, et cetera, into the future. Um, some of the other organizations sponsoring tonight's event include the Arab and Middle Eastern Journalists Association, Amija, NAP, the Network of Arab American Professionals, and the Ad, -Ha Ad Hoc Committee to Defend the Egyptian Revolution. Uh, we have uh, distinguished panelists, which uh, I shall have uh, Mina Khalil introduce to you. Uh, but what we're going to do is every panelist is going to pr uh, have a presentation, and then we will turn it over to questions. Um, hello, and welcome to the second part of our panel series um, commemorating the start of the Egyptian Revolution. Um, before we begin in earnest, I'd like to like briefly introduce the, um, the um, ad hoc coalition to defend the Egyptian Revolution, which was formed um, back in November following a call from Egyptian revolutionaries for um, Occupy movements and other solidarity movements worldwide to um, defend the Egyptian Revolution. So a number of activists in the New York City area uh, responded by organizing protests, denouncing the violent uh, military regime that is now in place in Egypt. Um, this, um, this group of activists has formalized in itself, basically put a name on it, which is the Ad Hoc Coalition to Defend the Egyptian Revolution. And uh, besides participating and organizing protests, we're, uh, we're trying to um, to um, organize um, other types of events like this one, which have a more of an informative or reflective role. <coughs> so tonight's panel focuses on the Egyptian army, um, in particular the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, or the SCAF. And um, our speakers tonight will attempt to answer your questions about, among others, the historic role of the army uh, in Egypt, the tactics that this CAF uses to maintain and consolidate its power, um, and the role of Egypt-US relations. I'd like to introduce our panelists, starting with Professor Zach, Zach Lachman, uh, who is a professor of Middle Eastern Islamic Studies and History at New York University. Um, he focuses on the socioeconomic, cultural, and political hi history of the modern Middle East, particularly the Mashriq. Uh, his books include Workers on the Nile, Nationalism, Communism, Islam, and the Egyptian Working Class with Joel ben Benin, uh, Workers and Working Classes in the Middle East, Struggles, Histories, Historiographies, and most recently, Content and Visions of the Middle East, the History and Politics of Orientalism. Um, Nancy Shami is an independent journalist and researcher whose work has been featured on Zenet, Jadalea, uh, and World Policy Blog. Nancy has graduated from Barnard College with a bachelor's degree in Economic History and Middle Eastern Studies. She is currently a research analyst at Cornell University's Institute for Compensation Studies, focusing on Egyptian political economy and modern social history. Um, Ashraf Khalil has um, covered the Middle East for the Wall Street Journal, uh, Los Angeles Times, Foreign Policy, The Times of London, and The Economist. He worked as a correspondent for the Los Angeles Times in Baghdad and Jerusalem, and has been based in Cairo for most of the last 15 years. He is an Egyptian American and a graduate, a graduate of uh, Indiana University. His first book, Liberation Square, Inside the Egyptian Revolution and the Rebirth of a Nation, which is available uh, right here, uh, was recently published by St. Martin's Press this month. And uh, Samah Salim is uh, an assistant professor in the Department of Africa, Middle Eastern, and South Asian Languages and Literature at Radgers University. Her research focuses mainly on modern Arabic literature, 
uh, in Egypt and the Levant. Her book, The Novel and the Rural Imaginary in Egypt, explores the relationship between the rise of the novel genre, the politics of nationalist representation, and the present question over the course of the 20th century in Egypt. Um, I think we'll start with Professor Lachman. Um, Thank you very much. It's a, uh, can everybody hear me? Okay. It's uh, a pleasure and, and even more than a pleasure and honor to be here with you on this first anniversary of the outbreak of the popular uprising that uh, in a remarkable 18 days uh, toppled Husni Mubarak. It's hard to believe that it's only been a year, um, although on other times it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it seems much longer than that, of course. Um, I am happy to, to call what's, what's happened in Egypt a, a revolution. Uh, I, I believe that in some ways it is uh, and, and certainly should be. But of course, um, it's also possible to say that uh, the, to call it a revolution, to, call it, to, to speak of an Egyptian revolution is really to speak of an aspiration rather than an accomplished reality, at least thus far. Uh, as we all know, the dictator uh, is gone, but most of the dictatorship, most of the regime as it existed uh, up till the 11th of February of last year remains in place. And of course, that includes the security apparatus, uh, which has worked very hard to reconstitute itself to overcome the setbacks, the defeats, the humiliations it suffered in the course of the popular uprising, and uh, has been back in the streets with, uh, in many cases, devastating effect. Uh, power in Egypt uh, remains to a considerable extent in the hands of the SCAF, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, a body which uh, existed basically only on paper uh, until the, the early days of February of last year. And the SCAF has um, displayed a remarkable uh, combination of a capacity for repression, often very brutal repression, uh, not hesitating to do some very horrific things to peaceful demonstrators in the streets of Cairo and, and other Egyptian cities. Um, and on the other hand, a fair degree of ineptitude. It's clear that uh, Marshal Tantawi and his uh, colleagues, the, the generals who constitute the staff, the heads of various branches of the Egyptian uh, armed forces, um, don't know much about governing and they're not very good at it. So they've also lurched from policy to policy um, and they've also, uh, and this is I think very important, at, at many moments have been forced by the popular movement in the streets to backtrack. Um, if you look at the long list of communiques, proclamations, orders um, that they've issued over the last uh, 11 months or so, uh, we can see that a lot of them have been dead letters almost from the moment they were promulgated because they haven't had the capacity to really uh, push them through. One example, the, the, the banning of strikes. Right? The, the, the popular uprising um, was bolstered in its last weeks by a massive outpouring of worker support, of strikes, of demonstrations, an explosion of formation of unions, a tremendous pent-up desire by working people who had been beaten down, whose wages had, been, uh, drop, had dropped over the previous uh, years and decades to organize themselves, to demand their rights, to demand social justice more broadly, um, and this resulted in a wave of strikes which the regime has been, uh, the SCAF has been unable to suppress. It's made efforts in various places, it's been successful in some instances, but by and large that energy uh, continues to be felt despite all sorts of decrees. Now, um, we're, uh, Egypt is entering a, a new period now. Uh, the lower house, the elections for the lower house of parliament, the People's Assembly have been completed. Uh, elections for the upper house whose status and, and duties have always been a little bit vague, uh, will take place shortly, and then down the road a bit, elections for a new president. And this means that a new stage of, of struggles is about to begin because uh, the new parliament uh, will have as one of its chief tasks, tasks perhaps its chief task, the, the drafting of a new constitution, um, and ultimately, at some months down the road, a civilian government uh, responsible to a parliament in keeping with this new constitution will be in place. The SCAF has said that it will step down from power, um, and it may well, at least in terms of, of abdicating its, its formal role as the supreme arbiter of power in Egypt. Uh, on the other hand, it's pretty clear that um, the 
the field marshal and the generals would very much uh, like to preserve their privileged status, uh, very much hope that they can get away with institutionalizing their power behind the scenes. And the struggle over the next six months, year, perhaps beyond, will be whether they can get away with this or not. Now, the dominant political force as a result of the elections, the Muslim Brothers, have a very long history of uh, enduring repression at the hands of uh, Egyptian regimes going back to 1954, going back much earlier, in fact, into the 1940s, but certainly uh, from the consolidation of the Nasser regime. Um, it's a very cautious movement. Uh, this is their, their great moment that they've been hoping and dreaming of for a very long time when they actually have a chance at assuming power. But it's also a movement that was propelled to power by this popular uprising. And it's a movement whose leadership is feeling its way, has its own divisions, it has different constituencies it has to answer to. So the question of whether uh, the Muslim Brothers will seek to cut a deal with the military, allowing the, military, the command of the military, when I speak of the army I mean these top commanders, because the military is not one institution and we need to keep that in mind, will cut some kind of deal or will be propelled from below to push for democracy. This is one of the key questions of the period ahead. Now the military as an institution has a very long history uh, in Egypt and in many ways has been central to the for formation of Egypt as a modern state uh, and enjoys uh, or has enjoyed at least a fair degree of legitimacy as a, as a key institution of the nation state. Uh, if we go back to the, the figure who is uh, depicted in the historiography of Egypt as the founder of modern Egypt, um, we can see that one of his key preoccupations was the formation of a modern military apparatus, right? Uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, who is not himself Egyptian, of course, um, who is of Albanian origin, but came to Egypt uh, in the very first years of the 19th century with an Ottoman force sent to retake Egypt from the French forces under Napoleon who had occupied it, um, then made himself the basically uh, autonomous, almost independent ruler of Egypt, uh, despite the fact that Egypt was nominally still part of the Ottoman Empire. And the first, one of the very first things he tried to do was build up uh, a modern army in order to secure control of Egypt for himself and what he hoped would be the dynasty that he would found. And it was this effort to create an army um, that propelled many of the, the very dramatic social institutional transformations that Egypt underwent in the first half of the 19th century. If you want a modern army, you need to train officers, you need military schools, you need to train doctors, you have medical schools, you need engineers, engineering schools, um, importing advisors from abroad, importing equipment, but increasingly trying to produce it locally. It set off a, a series of transformations that uh, were central to the formation of the modern Egyptian state. Now, he's often depicted as a great reformer, the person who brings all, this, uh, all these enlightened reforms to Egypt. But of course, uh, from the perspective of, of the Egyptian masses, many of these things were not good, right? Because one of the things Muhammad Ali does is introduce conscription, forcing people who had never before been subject to conscription to serve under often horrific conditions in the military, sometimes for years on end, and a great many people who were drafted into the military never got home again. Uh, and of course, a, a massive exploitation of the country's human resources in order to pay for all this development, this all this state building, which benefited Muhammad Ali and the dynasty and, and the new social groups that, that were able to take advantage of this, but often meant uh, a much worse life for the great mass of, of peasants and poor urban population. And it also was accompanied by a degree of expansion. Right? The Muhammad Ali went off and conquered Syria from the Ottomans and he conquered uh, the Sudan to create a sort of mini empire for himself. Uh, not something that I, the Sudanese would have very good memories of uh, down the road. Nonetheless, this set in motion uh, social changes that would be central to the emergence of an Egyptian national identity. Um, Egypt would be occupied by British military forces in 1882 and would remain under British occupation in one form or another uh, into the 1950s, at least British troops remained on Egyptian soil down to 1955. Um, and the British occupied Egypt because a group of Egyptian army officers of authentic Egyptian origin uh, began demanding a say in 
their country's government on behalf of much wider sections of the Egyptian population. And uh, to uh, forestall this, to reassert control, to make sure that the bondholders who own the Egyptian public debt would get their money back, Egypt occupied the country and would retain a grip on it for many years to come. The British did their best to reduce the size of the army. They were not interested in any large military establishment given their experience at the onset of the occupation. Um, and even after Egypt won limited independence in 1922, the army remained relatively small. But one of the first things that uh, the new government in Egypt did after a treaty was signed in 1936 with Britain that allowed for a much greater measure of independence was to begin to build up the armed forces and, and more specifically to open the military academy to middle class Egyptians, to the sons of middle class families. Previously, the, the ranks of the officer corps had been dominated by people from the, the Turco-Circassian caste, the very upper class, people connected to the, the monarchy, the nobility, the large landowners. And so it was that in 1936, 37, 38, you get these young men uh, often very patriotic, having been involved in the struggle uh, for, for a fuller degree of independence, increasingly aware of the grave social problems and social inequities that Egypt suffered from, who entered the military academy because this offers them some hope for social mobility. And it's just this, these cohorts, the people who entered the military academy in the late 1930s, who will seize power in 1952 having experienced the, the corruption, the bankruptcy of the monarchy, having fought in Palestine in 1948, having been sent off poorly equipped, uh, poorly trained, poorly led uh, by a government which got into this without much forethought or planning, um, decided that their moment had come to do something different. And in 1952, they overthrow the king, uh, later abolish the monarchy, and set Egypt on a new course, of course, led by a young Colonel Gamal Abdel Nasser. Now, this generation um, would dominate Egyptian, the Egyptian state for an entire period, for 20 years or so. They took off their uniforms. You, know, you don't see, after the first couple of years, Nasser in his military uniform anymore. But if you look at the personnel who are the, the, the ministers who occupy key positions in the civilian government, a great many of them are colonel, former colonels, majors, et cetera, who are part of the free officers movement or, or take over these positions afterward. In the early 1960s, the, the, the great Egyptian uh, Marxist uh, Anwar Abdul Malik, who had been living in exile for a very long time, published a book, which is still worth reading, called Egypt Military Society. It was one of the best analyses of, of Nasser's Egypt up to that point. And he called it military society, not because he thought the society was so thoroughly militarized, but because he was trying to come to grips, among other, thing, with, uh, other things, with the fact that this state seemed to be dominated by army officers. And this had certain manifestations in the sense that, and we can see perhaps a little bit of this in the SCAF, right? these were people who were used to giving orders. Right? These were not civilians. They were not civilian politicians. Um, and although the Nasser regime carried out a, a range of social reforms, land reform, that, that led to real um, increases in the standard of living for broad sections of the population, including broad sections, poorer sections of the population, this was done in a thoroughly top-down manner. Nasser established an authoritarian one-party state, which didn't hesitate to use a great deal of repression against its, its enemies, real and imagined. Uh, and these two things went together. They, they, they went together relatively successfully up to a certain point, of course, until the defeat in 1967, with, which discredited the regime and this particular model of authoritarian populist developmentalism. At, even after Nasser's death in 1970, the regime continued to be led by military men, right? Anwar Sadat had been one of the free officers who came to power with Nasser in 1952. Um, and in many ways, his legitimacy was built on the fact that he had overseen what Egyptians perceived as a successful military operation uh, against Israel in the 1973 war. Um, and he, in turn, was succeeded by the, the commander of the uh, Air Force, Hosni Mubarak, who he, uh, Sadat had made his vice president. Both Sadat and, and even more so Mubarak that just did no longer rule through military men. The military had its own particular domain. 
Uh, it got all sorts of benefits. Its budget basically escaped oversight. And as all of you know, the Egyptian military controls a very large chunk of the Egyptian economy. Um, industrial plants, land deals, on and on. And again, the rank and file soldiers don't benefit from this, but the top officers do and, and gain a lot of clout from controlling uh, this, this, these segments of, of the economy, even though the state itself or other sections of the state are run largely by civilian technocrats of, of one kind or another or people politically connected through the apparatus of the former ruling party, the National Democratic Party. And it's, it's these, uh, this privileged position, the absence of any civilian oversight, um, the fact that no one really knows what happens to the billions of dollars in American aid that get funneled into the military, where they end up, what they're used for. This is something which the, the generals presumably know, but Egyptians by and large, and even those uh, in the civilian side of the state uh, often don't. And this will be a critical question in the period ahead. Um, and, and whether the SCAF will be able to get away with entrenching this political position despite the fact that we had this, that, that Egypt experienced this popular uh, uprising that overthrew the dictator, whether they'll be able to preserve the position they've enjoyed over the last several decades. The SCAF is counting on the widespread desire, a genuine desire among many Egyptians for stability. There are certainly Egyptians who are tired of, of protests. Um, on the other hand, there's also a genuine desire for change and for, for, thorough, for a thorough transition to democracy, a genuine transition to democracy, a pressure from below. Um, and the, the, the fate of Egypt, in a sense, will be hanging in the balance over the period ahead um, with some very critical choices to be made. In these days, the Egyptian government is, is negotiating again with the International Monetary Fund. Now, Egypt was one of the, the models um, praised in December of 19, uh, of, excuse me, of 2010 by the IMF for its exemplary implementation of structural adjustment and so on. The very policies that impoverished millions of Egyptians um, and that produced a lot of the energy that, that brought people into the streets in January and February and, and continue to fuel a desire for change. Right? Egypt is in an extremely difficult economic situation at the moment with tourism down drastically and foreign investment having, having diminished drastically and so on, um, and prices rising very quickly, and there's a tremendous amount of frustration about it. And the question is whether this will be channeled in ways that further the democratic project and the project of social justice, because the two will need to go together. A democratic government will need to address the real, genuine grievances of the great mass of Egyptians who have suffered from a, a, a disastrously unsuccessful set of economic policies pushed from abroad to a large extent by the Washington consensus with the blessing of the United States. The New York Times is still er editorializing even in the last days about how Egypt needs to carry these reforms even further, which means further impoverishment for a great many Egyptians, or a democratic movement in whatever uh, configuration will find other ways to mobilize to continue to put pressure to undermine the continued power or the, the effort by the SCAF and its allies to entrench their power in whatever form and find a new direction forward which offers some hope of, uh, of, 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 of realizing the aspirations of the millions of people who, who took to the streets uh, beginning a year ago today. Thank you. Thank you so much, and we'll turn to Nancy Lishemi now. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Um, I'm honored to be here today, and I feel very humbled by my fellow panelists, but um, hopefully uh, we can, uh, I can offer you a productive uh, discussion today. And thinking back on one year since the Egyptian Revolution, um, just last year, last February, I was on a similar panel talking about the Egyptian Revolution, and it was very funny. I was talking to one of my pa fellow panelists, and I was like, can you believe that we're here today? And he was like, no, but neither did, or could you have imagined that we would be here today? And he said, no, but neither did the CIA, and that's what's so great about this. <laughs> but I think we can all rest assured that the CIA is very interested in what's going on in Egypt now. Um, 
But thinking back one year since the revolution, one of the things that I find really interesting and um, have been very striking this past year is the change in attitudes of the people towards uh, the military. And I'd just like to preface my, uh, my discussion with the fact that I'll be using the term military and army and ESCAF interchangeably. And um, there is a, a distinction, as Professor, Lockman, uh, as Professor Lockman has mentioned. And back in January and February, during the beginning of this revolution, it was so interesting for me to see that one of the most overwhelming chants in Tahrir and in protests in New York City supporting Tahrir are that the army and the people are one hand, or uh, these invocations of the army's name, uh, or of even the marsh field marshal Tantawi's name as a protector of the people and as a savior of the revolution. Uh, there was a chant um, saying, uh, feel, uh, Oh, Marshal, they're killing your children in Tahrir. Um, and when I was in Egypt in December uh, participating in uh, one of the women's marches against the Supreme Council, you find protesters now using the same chants that were used against Mubarak and his family, except this time uh, against the army and demanding an end to military rule and even demanding the execution of the field marshal. And I think that this change in attitudes throughout this past year can tell us a lot, not just about um, the trajectory of the revolution and where it's headed, but also um, uh, is very telling as to uh, what the military's role uh, was at, um, right before the revolution and how uh, the military's role has changed uh, from uh, since the 1952 revolution and what role it's played in Egyptian politics and economics. And I think what we really see happening this past year is an unraveling of this uh, idealistic, nationalistic uh, facade of the uh, Egyptian military. Uh, and we, we see laid bare the fact that the military, or the ESCAF, is just another side to, to uh, the Mubarak coin. And we see that the military um, is very interested in maintaining the status quo and very interested in um, affecting as little change as possible. And uh, I think that one of the questions that I was very interested in is why were Egyptians so welcoming of the military on February 11th, or at least um, a majority of Egyptians? And, um, how can, and, and how can we perceive the military's role throughout uh, the history of Egypt in um, nationalist discourse and in um, political and economic discourse? And um, even though Professor Lockman uh, provided us with a, a very uh, insightful uh, a uh, view of the uh, uh, history of the Egyptian military, I'd like to go back to certain points that I think are worthwhile in, um, in telling us how the military or how Egyptian military society, how the Egyptian military has defined and redefined itself in Egyptian society. And I think that examining that can tell us a little more about um, why people's attitudes were the way they were on February 11th and how or why they changed. And the first point I'd like to go back to is uh, 1952 with uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser and his revolution. And it's kind of ironic, um, you know, just as an offside point, when you think of the 1952 revolution, whether you perceive it as a revolution or a coup, that once that, re once that um, uh, revolution took place, all structures of the former regime were uprooted and complete new social and political and economic structures were put down. And even though this was a very small um, group of officers that took over the country, it was a top-down revolution, as Professor Lockman had said, um, they were able to create radical change in the country, which is unfortunately something that the popular revolution in Egypt is struggling to achieve. So we see in 1952, when Gamal Abdel Nasser takes power, a welcoming of this idea of a more powerful and a more uh, sovereign and dignified Egyptian army. And I think that we can attribute that to uh, Egypt's defeat in 1948, a very shameful defeat. 
um, and underlying that defeat in 1948 was a lot of um, implications of government corruption of ministers and government officials striking um, faulty arms deals for their own personal gain or um, also underlying it is um, a lack of true sovereignty in the Egyptian state. And this, at this point in history is where we see Egyptian nationalism really becoming intertwined with uh, the army and the army and the Egyptian state becoming one. So that loyalty to Egypt is equal to loyalty to the Egyptian army and to a strong and powerful Egyptian army. And we see the army uh, gaining this privileged state in the Egyptian, uh, in Egyptian society and we see the army, army officers becoming this new class of ruling elite. And the army um, maintains this privileged status um, throughout the Nasser regime, um, even though it was, uh, uh, even though the Nasser regime was delegitimized by the 1967 defeat, the, ar the, the Egyptian people still maintained um, this desire for a strong army to regain its legitimacy and to regain Sinai, and, and that was achieved in 1973. Um, but with 1973, we, we find a new important point in the trajectory of the, trajectory of the Egyptian military. Um, with this shift in alliances between um, Egyptian-Soviet alliances to Egyptian-US uh, alliances and the advent of open door policy. And at this point in history, um, it's where we begin to see this um, distancing of the army from the from the front lines of governing, from the front lines of policy making. And um, this is when the army has to start to um, uh, share power with this rising class of um, crony capitalists close to the Sadat uh, regime. And that really solidifies, I think, with uh, the 1979 Camp David peace treaty. Up until that point, the Egyptian military, the Egyptian military state had legitimized itself and had defined itself as a protecting power uh, against Israel. And with this peace treaty, uh, that, kind of, um, that kind of identity could no longer be, um, could no longer be uh, 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 sustained. <laughs> that, uh, long, that kind of identity could no longer be sustained. And rather, uh, the Egyptian military, um, rescinded from the front lines of governing into, its, um, into, into building this economic enterprise that it has sustained throughout the past 30 years. And it's maintained its military legacy through the October 6th victory um, of 1973 that um, it has um, propagated and galvanized throughout the past 30 years as maintaining this nationalistic, strong, legitimizing image of the Egyptian army. And at the same time, um, since 1979, instead of being um, front line, in front lines of government or policy making, through subsidies and through land grants and um, through all of these privileges, the Egyptian military has been able to build a, um, an almost autonomous enterprise that can affect Egyptian politics, can affect Egyptian uh, economics, can affect Egyptian society. And uh, you'll find the military everywhere, uh, from, um, from uh, coastal resorts to hotels to industries to, um, to every aspect of the Egyptian economy. And even though the military is not at the forefront, it is still very much a military society. It is, the, the army is the largest and most powerful institution in the country. And even with the advent of privatization, when we see that the Mubarak government, rather than being retired army, uh, uh, army officers, is now, um, uh, he is now comprised mostly of businessmen, the army still maintains a very privileged status and has that ability to veto any policies that it sees threatening to this economic enterprise. And some estimates put um, the, uh, the army enterprise at holding 20 to 40 percent of the Egyptian economy. And of course, all of that is unchecked power, unchecked budget. You cannot audit the Egyptian army 
um, not just in cases of military, um, military budget, but in all of its commercial activities as well. And uh, you cannot write about the Egyptian army without a permit in Egypt. So you have this very obscure nature to the military institution, but you have still in the Egyptian psyche this nationalistic um, perception of the 1973 uh, army, the October 6th army that regained Sinai, and that has sustained this loyalty and nationalism to the army throughout those past 30 years. Since 1973, the army had not been deployed into the Egyptian streets, but for two times, um, I think, and that was once in 1977 during the bread riots under Sadat regime where they were deployed to maintain order and um, when the subsidies were reinstated. And again in 2008 during Egypt's bread crisis when uh, soldiers had to distribute bread to the bakeries to, um, to quell the, the unrest. So on February 11th, 2011, you have this image of the Egyptian soldier as the strong and um, the strong and and loyal and nationalistic Egyptian soldier of 1973, who and you have the image of the army that has maintained um, maintained stability and maintained um, maintained stability throughout the past 30 years and is not in the Egyptian psyche at the time synonymous with the Mubarak regime that has oppressed them and has been corrupt for the past 30 years. And since February 11th, we see that facade or that kind of perception um, come apart. And we've seen that um, the military has largely um, tried to effect as little change as possible. And all of the military's concessions throughout this past year have largely been reactionary concessions, small concessions trying to um, avert uh, a large protest or trying to divide protesters among themselves, whether it's um, getting rid of, uh, of uh, Ahmed Shafi or, um, or uh, Hassam Sharaf or whether it is uh, setting forth a timeline all of these were very reactionary um, concessions. And at the same time, uh, people have seen that the army is using the same tactics as the, as the Mubarak regime to quell, um, to, quell these, uh, to quell the uprisings, to quell protests, to, um, to maintain things precisely as they are. Uh, whether it's through the state media or these invocations that there are foreign forces moving these protesters in Tahrir or these people who are striking, or whether it is through violence and, um, and, and um, physically oppressing the, the protesters, or whether it's through virginity checks of female protesters, it's precisely out of um, Mubarak's game plan um, throughout the 18 days of the initial Egyptian revolution. And I'd like, uh, and at this point, um, I think the, um, the millions of people that came out in Tahrir today are, um, are, are, are proof enough that uh, Egyptians have realized that the Egyptian military is one and the same um, as the Mubarak regime, and they have the same interests. And while, and I, I'd like to uh, second what Professor Lockman was saying, that I don't particularly feel that the military wants to be in the forefront of politics and government. They were very comfortable uh, affecting power and affecting um, politics and economics from behind the scenes. But I think that if they feel um, that their privileged position is threatened, they will continue to try to um, be in the forefront if that's what needs to happen. But I think that moving forward, the focus has to be not just on getting a civilian government in power, but really restructuring the power dynamic and the privileges that the army has in Egyptian society. Um, having, a, having a civilian government in power that will um, have the same symbiotic relationship that the Mubarak regime had with the ESCAF is not going to um, have the results that the protesters want. 
um, what really needs to happen is a restructuring of that uh, relationship. And um, while that's going to be very difficult uh, with an institution so powerful like the army, I think that there is some hope um, from the bottom up. And we've seen that uh, protests have, got, have gained concessions and continued protests have gained concessions that might not have um, come forth if protests had ended on February 11th. But I also think that there's a lot of hope through all of these independent labor unions that have sparked up and through this um, renewed political awareness of the Egyptian people. Thank you. Well, I guess uh, first off, I'd like to say how thrilled I am at the turnout tonight. This is amazing. I mean, that I, I, I really wasn't sure what to expect. Uh, that, but my you know, hats off to to Amija uh, and to and to NAP, to the Network of Arab American Professionals. These are both organizations that I've been involved with for a couple of years, and uh, this is just a fantastic event. So uh, I'm I'm really pleased to be here. Yes, give yourselves a hand. This is great. So, um, I guess one of the things I remember the most about, I, you know, I covered the revolution uh, pretty much every day of it last year, and I remember walking to Tahrir Square in the evening of January 28th, around 10 o'clock at night. I had been covering the protests until about 5 or 6 in the evening. The battle was raging on Usrenil Bridge. And I had to go find a computer and an internet connection, which was harder than you'd imagine in a place with no internet. But you know, I, I managed to figure something out and, and start filing my stories. By about 10 o'clock at night, I was off deadline. Tahrir had fallen, the NDP was in flames, and I started walking across uh, the deserted Sith October, uh, October 6th bridge. And, I, and all I knew was that Mubarak had called out the military, and I didn't know what that meant or how they would be dealt with or how they would act or how they'd be reacted to. And I'm, I'm raised in America. I'm, I'm not raised in Egypt. I did not serve in the military. So I was not aware of people's attitudes towards them. And it was a real shock to me. I mean, I thought it would be a much tenser situation. And what I saw was this kind of festive atmosphere. These people that had been throwing Molotov cocktails at the police a couple of hours, hours earlier were like posing for pictures on the tanks. And, 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 you know, generally having a really good time. And, the, the, you know, I, I, I watched, like, these extremely patient tank commanders. Like, you know, there's kids sort of having a party on their tank and posing for pictures, and the guy's kind of making the wrap it up sign to them. And, and you know, I was, I was amazed at how incredibly patient the army was. And, and that was really my first experience with this deep respect that people had for the army. I mean, I didn't quite understand it. I didn't quite share it, but I had to acknowledge that it was there. And I think one of, and I've always been very curious about where that came from. We've seen it erode over the past year for obvious and well-deserved reasons. But I mean, one of my theories is not just that everybody did their time in military service. There's also a thing, my, I, you know, my, my father emigrated to the US in the late 60s. And he was a, a hardcore Nasserist who kind of lost the faith when he saw how Nasser actually ran the country prior to, uh, you know, and, and then 67 really kind of, you know, drove him out of the country. And, 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 but he says that back in Nasser's day, it wasn't the police that was grounding you up from your home and torturing you. It was the army. You know, they were the SOBs back then. And it's just kind of this quirk of history that the interior ministry and the police became ascendant, especially in Mubarak's time, and they became the torturers, and they became the out-of-control gang. But one of the things we've seen it, you know, it, 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 since February 11th, and, and, and really the cracks were obvious even during the revolution. You know, I remember during uh, February 2nd, the, 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 the Battle of Tahrir, you know, the, the, the camel battle that it's called, for, for lack of a better term. And, and people really, the army was, their actions were deeply suspicious on that day. I mean, they kind of, 
let people go in and, 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 and didn't really make any move to separate the two sides. And, you know, there were people that I, that I, that I interviewed who their faith in the army began to crack on that day. Um, many people still held it though. As of February 11th, I remember a good friend of mine, um, Hossam Hamalawi, who's a very prominent activist and an online presence and, and, and a real kind of hardcore revolutionary socialist firebrand. I give him credit. On February 11th, he was on TV saying, I do not trust these generals and no one else should. And he was in the minority. But I think, you know, the last year or so speaks well for, for his point of view. One thing I want to point out is that the huge turnout in the uh, parliamentary elections, don't confuse that with faith in the military. I think one, it was, it was really surreal being in Egypt in November, December, because you had massive, violent, deadly protests. And a week later, a week later and three blocks away, you had a packed polling station. It was, you know, it was such an incredible disconnect. And I think that a lot of Egyptians are just so weary of all of this and so desperate for something that's going to move them forward to the next stage. And they're hoping that these elections will just get us forward. And unfortunately, that weariness is translating into a real lack of appetite for further protests and further street violence and further street action, which is a shame because these street violence, the, the, this, the street action is the only thing that has produced any concessions so far. You know, that is you can go with a calendar and just mark major protest and major, not just protest, but violence, major concession. I mean, the, 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 the clashes in November and early December were hugely unpopular in Egypt. And it, it pains me to say that. They did not have the backing of the country. But they produced a massive concession that's almost kind of lost in the shuffle inside of Egypt in that as a result of that, the SCAF moved set a set a firm date for the presidential elections and set a firm date for their departure. There's now something to call them on if they drag their feet and moved it up by about eight months. That's huge. And it came as a direct result of street violence. So it, it's this, this disconnect that's, it, that's it, it, believe me, I'm sure it's very confusing from the outside. It's just as confusing from the inside. It, it, it's just dizzying what's been happening in Egypt. And, and I do partially blame the SCAF. I think they've wanted to keep it kind of muddied and, 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 and confusing. I think the, 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 the how, was anyone here in Egypt for election day and voted? Okay. I mean, I, I went, it was incredibly confusing. If you saw the list of candidates that were available, that were there, and this is a non-politicized, this is a country that's new to, to, to proper voting structures, high degree of illiteracy, you know, and it was incredibly confusing. The list of candidates for a single thing was this big. It had to be 60 names. And it, it was a mess. I think it was kind of designed to be a mess. It's remarkable that people did turn out in those numbers, and, it, and, and it's something that gives me some sense of optimism. So I mean, I don't want to go too long because I really want to get into the Q&A as well, but I wanted to just run through some very quick reasons I had, a couple of reasons I a year later, reasons for pessimism and reasons for optimism. And we'll start, we'll end with the good stuff. So um, I mean, one, one, you know, starting with my reasons for pessimism is definitely the lack of enthusiasm that I'm seeing among Egyptians for continued protests. You know, it's, it's, it's depressing how effective the rhetoric has been about stability. Like after 30 years of seeing the words, if I never hear the word stability again, right. and it, 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 seeing how effectively they've managed to plant, just, just adopt the exact same rhetoric as Mubarak and it works and that I, I, it bugs me every time. So there, there is a real lack of enthusiasm for continued protest, but at the same time, there is an acknowledgement among many of the hardcore protesters, they're totally fine with being in the minority. They're, they're okay with that. They think they were in the minority a year ago. And, and the, 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 the Hizb al Kanaba people, the party of the couch, you know, that basically that, that the most of the country kind of sat home and waited to see who the winner was and then came out in the streets. 
my biggest problem with the way with what's been happening is what I, I think there's been a lack of the, for, it's a cliched term, but the, sort of the internal revolution, the personal sort of moral and ethical revolution. That is also what Egypt needs. It needs a structural revolution. The interior ministry needs to be completely reformed. The, the information ministry, I think, should just go away. I, I, I don't want an information ministry. I don't see a point in it, but, except for evil. The only purposes it serves are, are negative. It, it plays no possible positive role, and we've already seen that in that you know, you expect the people in Mespiro, the people at state television, the people at the newspapers, to suddenly expect them to be proper journalists. They, they have no practice at it. They weren't hired as proper journalists. They weren't promoted for their skills as journalists. So to suddenly expect them to play fair, it's terrifying for them. So they, they are going to automatically revert to, they're gonna, they're gonna go from kissing NDP butt to kissing SCAF butt and they're, I'm sure they're ready, willing, and able to start kissing Muslim Brotherhood butt. Just whoever is in charge. They, they, they stand there as this very negative force, just propagandists for hire. It, it really, it just, it, it needs to go away. So that's the argument, that's the argument for structural change. But there's an internal ethical and moral revolution that I don't think Egyptians have quite faced up to, and it's going to take about 10 years. I mean, I really think about you know, in, in Tahrir Square, it was a really special place. I don't know how many people here made it there during the revolution. I'm so nostalgic for it. And every time, every time I find myself walking into Tahrir Square, in a, in a car, I don't, I'm not struck by this, but when I'm walking into Tahrir Square, I immediately think of the revolution because there were no cars. Everything was, was shut down. And you start looking around for the inspection points for the guys to sort of pat you down and, and check your ID. And it was a different place. They, they cleaned up after themselves. I can't tell you, I can never get over this. Every time, every single time I went into Tahrir during the revolution, it, the, the streets were cleaner than the street outside my apartment in Giza has ever been. They cleaned up after themselves. And you have to have lived in Egypt for a while to realize what an amazing thing that is. You know, sexual harassment. I never heard about it all through the revolution. And I was asking, I was really looking for evidence that, that these people had, had, had changed the behaviors that, that, that plague Egypt so much. And, and the sexual harassment, it started on January 11th, when all the unreformed folks, you know, came onto the winning side and came out for the mulid, came out for the party. And that's when Laura Logan happened, but that, I mean, that's merely the most uh, egregious example. I, I was with a, with a group of friends on February 12th, sort of having a celebratory brunch, and there were several women there, and I was shocked, it was, it was depressing. It's like. Oh God, we're back to that already. Like we're we're 12 hours into the new Egypt and we're regressing. So there needs to be an acknowledgement that it wasn't them that ruined Egypt. It was all of us. It was it was us letting them ruin Egypt, and it was them. It was us letting them ruin us. And and we're not there yet. That's going to take a while. But I will say one thing, one, one, the one reason that I am not, one thing that is not on my list of pessimism and not on my list of worries is the Islamists. They don't scare me. They don't freak me out. I don't agree with them, but, well, we're going to make that distinction. And, that, that, that you, you know, and, and I think a lot of Americans are just now learning the word Salafist for the first time in the last year or so. <laughs> I only heard it for the first time maybe four years ago. And you know, the Muslim Brothers, they did, all, they did, they performed within their range. They did as well as they're pretty, they did on the high end of how you expect them to do. The surprise was the Salafist, and there was definitely this reaction among sort of the secular liberal, I hate these terms, but the, 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 the non-Islamist forces in Egypt going, who are these people? Where did they come from? And I'm not worried about them. I think the Muslim Brotherhood are pragmatists. I've been dealing with these guys for a million years. I don't fully trust them. I regard them as politicians, no more, no less, to the point of cynicism. I think they're going to cut whatever deal. I think we need to keep them from cutting a deal with the military. Right. But they're not going to try to impose Sharia. They're not going to do all this stuff. They're, they're not. They're, they're far too PR savvy for that. The Salafists, that's a whole other thing. You really can't talk to these guys. And I'm actually kind of looking forward to the next five years. I want, I want live microphones on these guys at all times. <laughs> You know, there, there was a moment a couple of presidential elections ago, remember when Pat Buchanan was ascendant and coming up from the right? And they gave him the plum spot at the Republican National Convention. 
And he basically scared away half the country and never recovered from that. And they're, they're, they haven't hit their ceiling yet, but it's coming. They're going to flame out. And, hmm? Yeah. They're, 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 they're going to flame out. They're going to, I'm really looking forward to watching these guys just gradually alienate the country. I mean, this is a lapse into, a lapse into Arabic slang for a sec. You know, I, I had this realization a couple months ago. The reason the Salafists will never rise above this level and can only go backwards is, is Hashem <laughs> they're, they're, and they're, 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 it's, a, it's very Egyptian slang. It just means they're, they're heavy blood. They're dullards. They're no fun. They don't believe in fun. And, and Egyptians are fun people, you know? <laughs> Fun that has nothing to do with drinking or sex or anything like that. You could have totally halal, whatever. Fun. But these guys, they're just no fun. And they'll never, they've gone, I think they've gone as far as they're going to go. And they're, they're going to, I'm really looking forward to watching them self-destruct over the next couple of years. As far as optimism, and I probably need a couple more minutes, or two more minutes, no problem. Optimism, look, the place has, the place has passed a point of no return. And, and it, is, it is politicized. I cannot tell you how great it is to be in a politicized Egypt. It's been so many years where people were just turned off. People thought there was no point in caring about this stuff. And those who did care enough to get off the couch weren't joining parties because there was no point in joining a party. They were, have, they were having protests. So seeing these guys get into politics, seeing what a raucous and confusing political situation it was, the, the, the symbols, I used to love the symbols for this, for, for this election were tremendous because you've got such high illiteracy, so candidates are identified by their symbols. Previous elections, you only had like three parties that even were trying. So you got, you know, one guy has a crescent, one guy has a Ramadan fanus, one guy has a camel, whatever. Here you had to have, there was so many symbols. There was like, the, somebody has a blender, another guy has a washing machine. <laughs> You know, my buddy Sand Monkey, the blogger, he had a laptop. There was sunglasses. So the, 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 some people, the, a bunch of Fulul, the, the Hizbil Muhafazin, the conservative party, had a tank. <laughs> it was hilarious. And it's symbolic. And it's, it's symbolic of something good. It's symbolic of what I hope is a point of no return. And the other thing that makes me, makes me optimistic is, you know what? There's another election coming in five years. And my, my number one priority is just to make sure that that election happens. Whatever happens in the next five years, providing this next constitution isn't, com isn't a complete train wreck, and it, it might be, but as long as there's another clean, semi-clean election in five years, because the, these secular liberal forces that, that came out and, and just didn't have enough time to get their act together, you know, the, 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 the smartest ones among them are the ones that I've talked to that are like, you know what, I knew I was going to lose. I went there to go get my butt kicked and learn and meet people and network and I'll be back in five years. You know, the ones who sort of throw up their hands because they lost one time, they're not built for this race anyway. So that, I'll, 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 I'll leave it to the Q&A. <laughs>